I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Bigfoot Breakdown. Today we're going to talk about Ivan Sanderson's paper on the Minnesota Iceman. And I thought it was interesting since it wasn't that long ago we actually covered uh, Frank Hansen's story. And, and I thought it would be interesting to do kind of a follow-up. And... Um, in a few weeks, maybe we'll do Hoovelman's paper also on the Iceman, since it was uh, Ivan Sanderson and, and Bernard Hoovelman's, who were both qualified scientists who actually went and examined, albeit the creature was in the ice block, but they were able to examine it. So let's dive into Sanderson's paper here. Um, okay, it begins with... Um, Preliminary descriptions of the external morphology of what appeared to be a fresh corpse of a hitherto unknown form of living hominid. This paper describes, somewhat general terms, the result of a preliminary inspection of the corpse of what appeared to be some form of large primate of hominid form. The notion that it is a composite manufactured from parts of human corpses and or other animals must of course be considered. Since the body has not yet actually been examined, because it was in the ice. Um, it should, or should it be the artist who put it together, inserting several million hairs in the skin before it rotted or was preserved to have been, or had some concept work form. And there's no such extent. So apparently, you know, and he makes a good point there. Uh, if someone were to have created that, they would have had to have placed all of these hairs, because we're talking, um, I'm trying to think when they, they went in the 1960s and I don't remember what, exactly what year they did their examination. It doesn't, um, I don't think it listed here, but we'll go into that. Uh, but it's interesting. There was no, he said there was no proof that, you know, anyone creating such a thing would have, or no evidence of them having planted, you know, these, uh, inserting several million hairs. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this for the following reasons. The body is not that of any known hominid, pongid, uh, so no hominid or pongid. In those days, they separated human lineage and the hominids, and then all the, the great apes were pongids. Um, and what was much more significant, it does not conform to any reconstruction or artist conception of any fossil man or ape or other anthropoid. Its general features and particular characteristics as detailed above display an extraordinary mixture of what had until now been assigned to either men or apes. So apparently they felt that there was a combination of features of man and ape. Uh, but it also mm -hmm. shows others that have never been assigned or attributed to any of either. So like we've talked with Forrest, you know, uh, these creatures exhibit both human and ape qualities but also things that are neither and and must yeah. be considered their own species right okay however two separate companies specialize in model making for waxwork museum exhibits and film companies in hollywood california have been traced and individual model makers working for both have stated that they made copies with wax or latex using hair from bears Mr. Hansen, the caretaker, informed us in January of this year that such a model had been made in April of 1967 because the owner of the original was worry, worried about its safety. That's interesting, where he says, the owner, uh, mm -hmm. indicating that Hansen was not the owner at this point. I find that very interesting. Um an object such as this could poten or possibly be constructed starting with the skin of a large male, pale-skinned chimpanzee using a human skull, glove makers, wood racks for the hands, and so forth. Uh, the original could have been made of this nature, but then a copy or copies made from it. Okay. 
Just in case this might not be the origin of the specimen, we should consider the alternative, namely that it is a genuine corpse of a comparatively recent killed specimen, not fossilized in any way. Some, por- some form of uh, parahominid. This is the considered opinion of Huvelmans uh, and is based on as thorough an examination as he was able to make considering the specimen is encased in ice uh, and is more than half opaque and sunk about two feet below the glass cover of its container. And if this is the correct interpretation, uh, we would opine that it is more probably to be on the hominid rather than the podgid stem of anthropoid evolution. And personally, that's my opinion that they're, I know Forrest thinks they're ape. Um, I think they're more, you know, not human, but in the hominid family rather than the great apes. I know, I know today that anthropologists have tried to combine all of that, but that's my feelings. Um, let's see, where are we here? Okay. Uh, just where it should be and placed in that stem cannot, of course, be said until it has been properly examined out of its iced envelopment. Further and much more important will be any analysis of its blood, plasma, and other bodily fluids, if they are still sufficiently preserved for typing. Even then, we w- we may well be confounded because this specimen displays such a combination of characteristics attributed to the two presently thought quite separate uh, families of anthropoid primates and it constrains us to add a note of added, added caution okay in view of the fact that the pongids and hominids have now been shown to fall into several groups together um, okay he talks about the caucasoid and congoid hominids <laughs> with gorillas and chimpanzees on one hand and the maize, simangs, and gibbons, among other pongids, with the mongoloid hominids on the other. Uh, it is not possible. And, you know, anthropologists, they change all these groupings. This was, you know, back in the 60s, so there's been a lot of changes since then. So, you know, right. folks, folks were talking about uh, historical documents, so don't get too wound out by terminology. All these things have changed. Um he says, we will have to add to the hairy man to Desmond Morris's naked ape. Anything of this nature will probably or absolutely demand an overall revision of our our ideas of both physical and social anthropology and will present a somewhat alarming problem to scientists and regionists alike, or religionists alike. Sorry about that. Um, This author's uh, personal opinion as to the precise identity of this specimen is at the moment not formulated so he didn't have any idea about it. As a trained zoologist, and one who spent many years collecting mammalian and particularly primate specimens for examination, dissection, preservation in the field, and while fresh, we would not presume to make any definite pronouncement upon anything other than a purely generalized overall description of its external appearance. The corpus must be freed from its ice encasement and properly examined first. However, some speculation as to the taxon- taxonomic status of the creature, if it finally proves to be real, is perhaps permissible, since we do have detailed measurements and photographs to back it up. It is Huvelman's opinion, which he states categorically in his paper, and, and we'll talk about his paper down the road, um, that this body represents fresh remains of a Neanderthaloid human. Such hominids are currently classed as sub as a subspecies of Homo sapiens, yet Huvelmans has named this item Homo pongidoides, uh, and thus a full specific rank. And I think Huvelmans caught a lot of flack for that by, you know, kind of jumping the gun and, and giving something a name at that time. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of raked over the coals for a long time and never really given, I think, the credit he was due. Um Though we suggested that the appellation Ponjoides in the first place uh, was envisaged it either as a sub-specific to Homo sapiens, which we have no idea as to his external morphology of the fossil Neanderthaloids, or merely as a, a uh, possible specific for some genus of anthropoid. So, 
again, you know, going back to how anthropologists do things, you know, there's a, a lot of discussion and changes within the anthrop- mm-hmm. anthropological community about what belongs to what. Um, you know, my personal thought, you know, for what it's worth on the, the Iceman is that they're uh, not in the Bigfoot family, that they're some other relic, you know, hominid. Well, I find it interesting that him being a trained zoologist, the fact that he didn't just come right out and say, okay, this isn't real when he saw it in the ice. It, right. it had to have been something that looked real enough for him to say he doesn't have an opinion at this time. Right. And you know what's interesting? I, I've been contacted by another a number of people who actually got pretty close to the, the block itself, and it was outside of the case where they were right at the ice Mm-hmm. And where there was actually some hair sticking out of the ice because the ice had melted significantly. And they all talked about things like, um, you know, seeing, you know, urine in, in the ice from the creature's penis. Uh, there was blood in the water from where the gunshot wound was. There was the smell of rotting flesh coming off the ice. Yep. Um, and, and you wouldn't have that with a fake. And yes, there was the fake made and it was swapped out for the real one, but... These are from people who actually got to see the original before, you know, Hanson swapped it out for the fake one. Right. Okay, so let's move on. Um, okay, let me get in here. We are, const- uh, we are constrained to do... Okay, this is about giving the name. We're constrained to do this not only because we are personally averse to naming any specimen before it has been physically obtained and properly examined... Uh, but also precisely because we are not convinced that this specimen is a Neanderthaloid or even a member of the genus Homo, which it presently constituted. Further still, it might not even be an anthropoid, but rather a survivor of a line of divergent form and possibly lying between the hominid and the ponjoid branches. So um, he's saying it's it may not have been either, you know, of, of the hominid or human lineages or the apes it was something something on its own in between yeah what can be seen of the con confirmation of the face meaning the front of the head in no way conforms to any known fossil hominid apart from the juvenile uh australopithecoids and particularly that to that of the Neanderthaler of comparable size uh so this is something uh, forrest talked about there's no prognathicism which is the protruding face yeah. virtually no brow ridges now the sasquatch is often and what i saw they have very heavy brow ridges so uh again it's you know the morphology or physical characteristics <laughs> don't match up to bigfoot okay he says um the forehead does not slope acutely the two front teeth can be seen as infantile Oh, oh, the two teeth that can be seen are infantile. In fact, from what can be assessed of the anatomical structure of the forepart of the skull, this creature is all, almost as far from the standard Neanderthaloid construction as is possible. It is these same respects. It shows no affinity with Homo erectus or Homo habilis, what is known of the same. Um, or more specifically, such lower types as once... Okay, he's using a lot of terms that they don't use anymore for uh, fossil hominids. Okay. Let's see. So he's saying it is most certainly should not be assigned to the Neanderthal race or complex. Uh, Our final conclusion, therefore, is that the specimen we inspected was that of a genus corpse as opposed to a composite or construction. So they felt it was real. And that it is some form of primate, we would categorize it as of now as an anthropoid. But whether it is a hominid or a pongid or a representative of some other previously unsuspected branch of that superfamily, we are not prepared either to say or to even speculate. There are certain firm indications that the specimen examined by Hulvemans and this writer, though it has been removed from the place where we saw it and hidden, uh, this must have been around the time that they replaced it with the uh, the model. Yeah. Um, 
and has not been destroyed, destroyed, therefore eventually become available for proper scientific examination. Until such time as this is achieved, we advise that it serve only as a pointer to the possible continued existence of at least one kind of fully haired, ultra primitive anthropoid like primate, and be used only as a lever to pry open the hitherto hidden bound notion that any such thing is possible. Well, what are your thoughts? The fact that this zoologist was having such a hard time deciding whether or not what he was looking at was real, I find very interesting considering he was trained and knew what to look for, knew how to identify things. Yeah, I think I think his opinion was that it was genuine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, being that it was encased in ice, they couldn't give it a proper examination. So right. they had to kind of leave the question open. And I think... Uh, I think that's where it is today, folks. You know, what do you think? Where is the last, where is the last it was heard uh, being? Didn't somebody buy it or something? Well, okay, it's, it was speculated, and, and I'm going to, we'll have to go over that later on too. We'll do it in, in another episode. But um, uh, in general terms, it was speculated that uh, the owner, as, you know, he says that Hansen says Hansen talked about the owner of the specimen, meaning it wasn't him at that mm-hmm. time. Uh, the speculation was that actor Jimmy Stewart owned it at this point. Okay. And and again, you know, we'll go into that. But the most recent thing I got was from, and I, the person never did actually uh, talk to me to interview, but I got an email from someone who says that. Um, she was apparently dating someone, at least for a time, here in California, mm-hmm. and um, was taken to a storage facility where the original is, or at least was at that time, and this was just two or three years ago, I got this email. And uh, <laughs> she was taken, and apparently, you know, the person was trying to impress her, took her in to show her this thing. And that's, and that's where some of the description was there was much less ice and there were hairs and things sticking out of the ice um, and the smell and all that stuff. So uh, that's that's the most recent I have on it. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I really wish that that person would have, you know, and, and maybe they were in, in fear. Maybe they were threatened not to talk about yeah, it. I don't never know. know. Yeah. So, folks, uh, we'll put it in your hands as usual. Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.